I appreciate the patience of the Parker congregation with my trial sermons. Because <laughs> they are all trials, I can tell you. My people have never heard the last several sermons. They've not heard it at all. And uh, <clears throat> this one really is a trial. This one's not that it's a trial to me, and it may be that too. I take Jesus to keep from being that. But uh, this one is, um, well, I need many more days, it would seem, or many more weeks to talk to you about this. Nevertheless, I've been in this passage for months now. And uh, one of the reasons for staying in is because I'm not satisfied with what insight or revelation God has given me and sensing, because the word is eternal, that there's much more there, I just simply stay with it. Day and night, often turning my light on at night and just reading through it and reading through it and reading through it. G. Campbell Morgan always read his passages 40 times before he ever preached them. 40 times. And so when you read his writings and you, 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 you under his pen you feel the exposition, you can see that he's one of the men that simply immersed himself in the Word of God and it would soak in him and he would live it and breathe it and eat it. So I tried to immerse him. I've not read, I may have read this passage 40 times through the summer, but G. Campbell Morgan before every Sunday would take that text and he would go through it and go through it and go through it and go through it and go through it because at some moment it may open up. Glory may open up. And, and the revelation fall into his soul. Don't be hard on people who are not Christian. Because we don't have as much revelation as we think we do. To start with, most of us have been brought up from children to think this is right. But God has given us an advantage to put us in the right way that we might receive the revelation. And for persons outside Christianity to receive the revelation of Christ, to receive the revelation of the blood. They don't have the natural atmosphere for it. And it takes an, an immediate miracle for them to get it. I'm thinking of, of uh, Sister McCall of Urbana, Ohio. She thought that her husband, Jesus, was for Americans and Buddha was for Japanese. She was of the Buddha, Buddhist faith. But when she was in her bed dying, and in fact, she died. The air around her stopped, and she knew she was dead. Yet her spirit had not left her body yet. And while she was still in her body, and even though she was dead, uh, there suddenly was Jesus at the foot of her bed. And immediately she knew who he was. And immediately she knew what the blood was about. Immediately she knew that he died for her. And immediately she was under conviction. So the revelation came just like that. She's from Japanese. So we don't want to be hard on Jewish people or Japanese or Indian people because it takes a revelation. It took a revelation for Jeff Prada. She had as a young girl. She saw him there, saw a vision of Jesus crucified and the blood. And the blood trickling down. And she knew that he was the Christ and the Savior of all men. So see, that revelation can come in an instant with no preparation at all. And so... She, she was under conviction, and so she said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. She knew to ask immediately. And she was, she was dead as far as the outward body, but not completely. It had been all over. She was still in the body. Hadn't gone, hadn't started for her reward. Isn't that wonderful? There she was. And he, he shook his head twice, I believe. And that means in Japanese, yes, I forgive you. And she was forgiven. She was cleansed just like that. And he healed her. And she was well. Now, if you remember, she went, she went home and for days ate nothing and nights. And her husband would see her light on all night long. And the reason she was so, the revelation was so great, she had entered, her spirit had entered, entered the heavens with such power and such impact of the blood that she didn't need anything to eat. All she did was read this word day and night. She didn't need anything. She, you read in the book of Revelation where, where he says, eat the word. Well, she did it, and she lived on it. She'd go right into her. There was just such, 
such life that came into her, such eternal life. And that's what we all receive at conversion. Under conviction, he forgave her. He said yes. And God gave her the revelation of who Jesus was. Then she right. knew Jesus was for Japanese. Because right. <laughs> Buddha was dead. But Jesus was alive. His blood availed for her. So, so I'm, I'm thanking you for your patience with me because I don't know. Uh, I'll stumble through this. And I was a sermon or two already where I've been so nervous about coming before you. And then I've got, I've got minds uh, that are better than mine here and, and Bible students and scholars that know more than I do. And so that just, that's good, though. That just make you humble, you know. I just say, well, precious Jesus, hallelujah. They've got to listen to me. Humble me and help me. When, you know, when you get mashed down low enough, well, there's something beautiful can come out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The ninth chapter of Hebrews, we went through this passage last week, but we're going, we're going to concentrate on two verses under the blood of Christ. When Christ came as high priest, this is the 11th verse. Remember in the, in the first few verses, he points out some of the glory of the, of the tabernacle, but it was, it was just dreamland for most all because they had never experienced what this writer tells about. Only the high priest could tell them of the glory and the presence of God that was over the mercy seat. And then in the next few verses, he says, he says in fact, but, but the limitation was there. This high priest only entered once a year. He, he never entered without blood. And he offered sin, uh, a sacrifice for himself and a sacrifice for the people. And he gives you the reason why in the 8th verse, the way into the presence of God or into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. And also he says that these gifts and sacrifices were not able to clear, to purge the conscience of the worshiper. The new order had not yet come, and these things were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Then, in the 11th verse, and I like the translations I told you last week, but Christ, but Christ came. My translation says, NIV says, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here. And I preached last week on good things already. Oh, I wish. Well, we had a time, didn't we? Jesus helped us. Oh, it fed my soul too while I was preaching. But Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death or dead works as some of your translations say, so that we may serve the living God. Remember that religion has to do primarily with three things. One is access to God everywhere. Religion is trying to get into the presence of God. Secondly, religion is trying to do, do away with types and shadows. Nearly all religion, and even the Christian religion, we're dealing an awful lot with types and shadows. We're dealing with that which points to the real. Uh, not in true Christianity, but, but I may point this out later. When you and I came out of uh, formalism, when you and I were called out of just ritual and just make worship, uh, we, were, we were called into the real. We were called to follow the voice of Christ. You see, so in Christianity, so-called. 
And it is in name, but yet there's so much type and shadow. There's so much that's unreal. That's what Janet was saying in her testimony. There's so much that's dead. And it kills. The dead works kill. And even as the letter, just simply the letter does. And so religion deals with access to God. Men are striving to get into the presence of God. And other men have instructed them how. They're trying to do it. In India, some sit on nails and they live on nails and torture the body to get into, you know, to accomplish the uh, to accomplish justice. He says the, sin of the, the soul that sinneth must die. So they think suffering, see, is the means of getting there. And uh, they accept, they try to themselves pay the price and it's an impossibility. So we have access. Then we have uh, getting from the type and shadow to, to the real thing. And finally, we have the necessity of sacrifice. And I've alluded to it already. God said the soul that sinneth must die. But the mercy of God <coughs> stayed our death. The soul that sinneth it must die, just like water must run down a hill. And she said, we can't eat of this fruit because God said we had died. Satan said, now, wait a minute. And he tried to, he tried to get her to be, uh, to get her away from that, and he did. And she did die spiritually. And would have, they suf- would have suffered an eternal death had she not have faith for the promise that came. So the soul that sinneth must die. But the marvel is that even in the very beginning, he provided at least in type a substitute. He was teaching us of Christ. He was teaching us that through God's mercy, though through holiness, we must die. Through God's mercy, there was going to be a substitute provided. So you have, you have three things. Access. You have the problem of types and shadows, and then, then you have the necessity of sacrifice. The efficacy of the Old Testament sacrifices would not have been, they would not have been efficacious had it not, or effective had it not been for what they pointed to. There was no saving power in the blood of a bull or the blood of a goat. No saving power at all. It's, it's, what, it's what they were tied to in promise. They were tied. Their sacrificial death meant nothing in and of themselves. But they pointed to something ahead. And the faith that the people had just to obey God, even though they might not have understood it at all, kept the channel open so that the power of the blood of Christ would reach back to touch them when they and stay their very death. It didn't purge them, but it stayed their death until the substitute, the real substitute could come. Isn't that great? Yeah. Well, I wish I could quit now while I'm ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Not really. I'm ready to go on, but I, I just say, Jesus, you help me there. See, I've preached to you uh, 15 to 16 sermons without notes on, the har- on one of the hardest, if not the hardest book in the Bible. And see, that's a miracle in and of itself. Because I have a B-grade mind. I, I, I work with men who have A-grade minds. He has an A-grade mind. But you see, God can teach us B-minded folks things. Even C-minded. I'm even bragging on myself to say that. But I've been in the presence of intellectuals, and they just, they just simply, they, they, well, they ball go, they I just, well, anyway, I, I know where I am. I, I, I may be B and I may be C, but he can be minded C. C is average. In the kingdom, there's nobody in D and F category. We're all, you know, we're all there somewhere. But, oh, praise the Lord for what he's able to teach me. See, I wouldn't even have tackled this if it hadn't been for Brother Ham. No way. I, but why? Because I'm sensible to, to an extent. And I don't tackle what I know I shouldn't tackle unless I know the Holy Spirit's leading. Unless, God, unless God's servant gives me the... I said, sir, do you mean I'm to go back and preach this message on car- carnality? You've got the revelation of it. He said, if you young men don't preach it, who's going to preach it? So I had my commission. I went back and hit a brick wall. And worse than that, I hit the wall of carnality. But God helped me. And I knew I was on a divine assignment, so I had peace in my soul. 
that, that, you know, that I wasn't just up against something I shouldn't be up against. I was up against something God wanted me up against. He wanted me against the carnality that was prevalent in my, our congregation and in my own heart. So, he went to a greater and more perfect tabernacle. I give you these access to religion. I mean, what religion's concerned about and the sacrifice that's necessary. That's why he said, that's why he said that without the shedding of blood, there is no, there's no remission. You can't get around the justice of God. God can't get around it himself. He's got, holiness has to be satisfied. There must be death. There must be something done about this. In order to get this way clear and to get holiness back in. So something's got to die. In fact, that was supposed to be you and that's supposed to be me. But in the mercy of God, he provides a substitute. And the substitute, and the substitute is the, the calves and the goats that's pointing to the one who will really avail and purge us from all of our sins. And so we read the 13th and 14th verses, and here's where I want to center the message. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially unclean. Sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Remember that the blood of goats and bulls, that's, that's referring to the Day of Atonement, where the priest went in, first of all, with the blood of a bull for himself, for his own sins. And then secondly, he went out, and go, a goat was, he put his hands upon the goat, and the goat, if you remember, the, our sins, they, they placed his hands upon the goat. It was called the scapegoat. And that goat was taken off into the wilderness. The blood of a goat was sprinkled. I'm not sure. I don't remember the details on this. But I know that the goat was for the people. The bull was for the priests. But it took the blood of goats and bulls to make them acceptable. That is, to keep death to keep them from suffering the penalty. All the while, the efficacy coming from that which would be happening uh, maybe thousands of years ahead or 1,500 years ahead since Moses came about 1,500 years before Christ. And then the Scriptures say something very unusual. Months ago when I read it, I just looked at it because I hadn't had enough help to understand why he would say anything about the ashes of a heifer. But... Uh, in Numbers 19, it describes the ashes of a heifer. Now, that had nothing to do with the Day of Atonement. But it did have to do with making the believer ceremonially clean. And it's a mystery as to why. The heifer was taken outside the camp and burned, all of him. He was burned. And before he was burned, there was cedar, hyssop, and scarlet, a piece of scarlet wool placed in these ashes. It was all burned. It was burned in a clean place. And it was placed in a vessel. And whenever a person would uh, come in contact with the dead, uh, God declared that he was unclean and could not enter the presence of God for seven days, and that only without being clean. And so he was, he was defiled outwardly. He was defiled ceremonially. And so the ashes of the heifer would be taken by the priest and sprinkled upon the person. Even when the heifer was slain, the blood of that heifer was sprinkled in front of the tabernacle. And uh, he was sprinkled on the third day, and he was sprinkled on the seventh day. And that's if he went into the tent of a, of a person who was dead. That's if he touched a dead a bone of something that had died. Or he touched a dead body. Anything that would be contact with the dead would make him ceremonially unclean. In order to be clean, he had to be sprinkled on the third day and the seventh day, and even the priest himself, when he touched the ashes, was unclean for the day. Now, that's, a great, that's a great mystery. But one thing God is trying to tell us is this. 
that defilement will not be allowed in his presence. That's it. That's it. Yes, sir. One thing he's telling us is that which is dead, de- sin, death is a result of sin everywhere. And whenever we're in contact with that which is dead, and our sins sure put us on the dead side. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. I'm not getting into the symbolism here, but one thing he's telling us is that it's a terrible thing to be defiled. How do we know it's terrible? Because that worshiper walked anywhere near the presence of God without being sprinkled by the ashes of this heifer by the priest himself, or the priest himself would walk in on that day. They'd drag him out. He'd be dead. And whether you understood it or not, there's one thing you understand. You, you don't do something that you know is going to bring your, about your death. No more than you reach into a wall socket and grip the electricity. Who understands it? No one understands it this day. But you know enough to not put your hand in there if you don't want to die. So one thing he's teaching us. Now we don't, this is, this is great, this great writer. If we were back there, we might have understood better. And were we more Jewish in our thinking, we might understand better. But we can study and pray and... And, and find out a little bit. One thing we know he's telling us that it is a terrible thing to, to try to enter the presence of God being defiled. God will not allow it. And that it takes uh, a sacrifice to, ju- to, uh, to satisfy the justice of God. It takes death to satisfy the justice of God in his holiness for the, the soul that sinneth must die Therefore, there must be something, there must be something in the mind of God that will take out this terrible barrier that's between man and between God. Well, the writer to the Hebrews is telling us what's more it is. Now he says, now he says, look what, look what the blood of bulls and goats would do. It would make a man acceptable. Outwardly, kept him from dying to enter the presence of God. That is the priest, not, not man, you see. Our consciences has not been purged, but representative man could go into the presence of God because of the blood of goats. And the worshipers could come into the precincts of the tabernacle by being sprinkled with the, with the ashes of a heifer if they had been in contact with something dead. But then he says, he said, look, look how that helped. Whether you accepted it or not, if you've been in contact with something dead, you don't want to go in a, a place where you're going to die. And so you were sprinkled with, with, uh, were sprinkled with those ashes and you were outwardly clean. Now, you can't say that it didn't do something for the conscience. It did. Once you did what God told you to do, it brought some peace to the conscience. But you can know, just as they knew, that it did not reach into the inner heart and purge the heart from the defilement of sin that was really there. See, they did all they could do. But even with that, and even with being made ceremonially clean, when they entered the place of worship, they were still convicted and rightly so. Because the blood of Christ had not been shed. But thank God they had a promise. And their faith in that promise made them acceptable until the time of the new order. And that's what it means by Abraham and in the over in the eleventh chapter, Abraham and the patriarchs had not received this time of perfection. They waited for us. See it was coming. And I personally believe that's why Elijah and Moses uh, appeared on the on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration to talk to Christ about his exodus because they'd never been in the presence of God, never been in the pure presence of God. They were in uh, some abiding state uh, as uh, in, the, in Abraham's bosom, Jesus called it, is where Lazarus was. When the blood of Christ was shed, the way was open for those, the dead who had died before to go directly into the presence of God. And that's why Paul could say, if I die, I'd be with the Lord, and that's a better place to be. Nevertheless, he wants me here. Oh, glory be to God. One thing can happen to us this morning. We have a better appreciation of the blood of Christ. Why is it so powerful? What is it about it? Well, I can't understand it all. But at least the Scriptures right here give us about three things to tell us 
how, why it is more powerful. For the writer says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, there it is right there, offered Himself, there it is right there, unblemished to God right there, there it is right there, there is why the blood's more powerful. This tells you why. We're talking about quality now. And because of this quality, it cleanses our consciences from acts that lead to death or from dead works so that we may serve the living God, serve and worship for the same thing in, in their origin. We may worship God. We may serve God. We may be directly in His presence. Look, who through the eternal Spirit you could substitute life for spirit there and understand it better. That is the blood of bulls and goats did not have eternal life in them, Amen. but his blood did. Amen. Their blood had earthly life, but they had deadness like ours. They were contaminated. Their blood was contaminated. His blood was pure. So there's your first reason right there. Through the eternal spirit. See? Eternal. There was nothing eternal in their blood. There was in His. Now, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. The Holy Spirit anointed Him. The Holy Spirit guided Him. But Christ gave Himself. So it's talking about His personality. It's talking about His life. It's talking about the power of God. You see, God came from eternity. The life of God came right down and entered time and space. It was right there in His blood. The power that created the world is right there in His blood. So what you have, first of all, what, the reason His blood is most power, more powerful is because it had the life of God. It had eternity in it. And the blood of bulls and goats did not have one ounce of it. it, on, it only, their effectiveness was only because they pointed. They pointed to something. Isn't that great? The blood of Christ has life in it. Oh, so when we say, when we say, uh, I, I repent of my sin, we say, uh, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of a bull and a goat never did it once. When His blood was shed, boy, the eternal effectiveness of God came to bear upon our souls and entered our consciences. Until no wonder when we were singing this morning, this sister shouted, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Life in the blood of Christ. That's enough to go home on. But this point number two, how much more then... Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer Himself? His blood was rational and was voluntary. Their blood, their blood was mechanical. So we, have, we title this sermon "A Blood Superior." It's got life in it, and it's a it's a voluntary blood. It's rational. He gave himself. They had no choice. Was slaughtered in innocent victims just to get the mercy, just to get the wrath of God stayed. But when Jesus came, he offered himself. His blood is more valuable because he died willingly. In fact, I'll make it simpler than that. Hallelujah. His blood had love in it. Had life in it. Had love in it. He offered himself. That's a better blood. A blood that's got life in it, eternal life. A blood that's got love in it, brother. That's superior to the blood of an animal any day. Love. He offered himself. He loved us. So it's got life in it. It's got love in it. And brother, let me tell you something. That's why we say I love him because he first loved me. When I know that he loved me, he loved me and he offered himself a voluntary blood. See the power in it? A blood that has life, but a blood that's rational of a thinking man, of a thinking God, of a thinking human being, God-man. And he gives himself, and so there's love in it. By the way, when John, that's the first thing John mentions in his book, in the book of Revelation, is the love that was in this blood. And I want to refer to that passage before I get to the last thing. John said, listen to this. <laughs> 
Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. It's the first chapter. I'm in the fourth verse. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him, here it is, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood, all right, strike and has freed us from our sins and get the meaning of it. To him who loves us by his blood. (laughs) There's love in his blood. To him who loves us, you see there's two aspects of the blood there, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And here, I've got a sermon just this morning. I saw this and underlined it. Listen to this. And has made us to be a kingdom. Hallelujah. It can't have a kingdom without subjects, and we're subjects of the king. It takes a king, and it takes subjects. But he has made us, a, a, made us to be a kingdom. That's another sermon. Kingdom priests to serve his God and Father. And, and John, with the thrill of this love that's in the blood, that has freed us from our sins, he says in his writing, To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Sure. Which one of when any of us has written a letter lately that had that strong of a... Of appreciation? To him be the glory and the power forever and forever. Amen. He had the revelation of the blood on the Isle of Patmos. Patmos. Brother, I tell you, he was sitting in glory. There was life in this blood, and there was love in this blood. All right, the final thing. To cleanse our consciences, to purge us from this defilement from acts that lead to death. Back up here. The eternal spirit, he threw the eternal spirit Christ did, offered himself unblemished to God. And there it is. Every sacrifice that was made to stay the wrath of God and to give us ceremonial cleanliness had to be a perfect sacrifice outwardly. But remember, their blood was contaminated. Not contaminated because... They committed sins voluntarily, but contaminated because someone else did. All of creation has been contaminated. So the, this blood was not a blood that was pure within. So your last reason why this blood, it's not the last reason, but it's all I've got listed here. It's what's mentioned here. The reason that it is superior to the blood of bulls and goats is because it's pure. It's an uncontaminated blood. The only uncontaminated blood that ever hit the earth. All the blood in all of creation has been contaminated by our sins. So much so that Paul tells us in a great moment of revelation that the very creation groans for this cleansing. The very creation groans for, groan, uh, groans for the redemption of the sons of God. It groans for their own redemption. Why? Contamination is everywhere. Deterioration is everywhere. And so... But his blood was not contaminated. It was pure. So we have life in this blood, a superior blood. We have love in this blood. And we have purity. Oh, isn't that great? Now, if we walk in the light, it keeps us clean. It cleanses us, makes us acceptable in the presence of God. But if we walk in the light, it keeps us clean. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, continues to cleanse us, keep us clean from all sin. So obedience, see, obedience, it's everywhere. His blood's everywhere. There's life and love and purity coming right in when you and I have the revelation, when you and I have the knowledge. The Old Testament worshiper knew, in all honesty, he was intelligent or more so than any of us, he knew that it did not purge his inner defilement. Therefore, he had to go to worship convicted. But the intensity and the, and the power of this blood reaching to our own life has something to do with knowledge. The more we know about this blood, 
the greater is its effectiveness in our own life. It is. If we just have enough knowledge that it saves us from sin, it saves us from defilement. But, oh, it purges us and keeps us from defilement. It's got power in it. And so we're singing this morning, there is power in the blood. Wonderful, wonderful power in the blood to keep us from sinning. I'm so glad for the mercy of God. There's a few that have availed themselves of walking with God without breaking step. And I believe Brother Ham to be this kind of a person. But I want to thank God that where I've broken step with him, that I could go back to John where he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and finish them all in righteousness. And then begin again to walk in the light as he in the light. But of course, God is looking for a people that will not go back. God is looking for a people that will travel on in obedience. And you know, ministers, part of the thing that this trip has done for us is make the blood more powerful in our own lives. Because it takes a greater self-denial for most ministers to leave their work at home. It takes a greater self-denial for... If there's joy in the heart of every believer, there's joy because as we look at the blood of God's grace and mercy and we have the knowledge of its effectiveness, we believe and we have faith and it comes in and cleanses us and makes us stronger and it sanctifies us. Isn't that wonderful? It's the only thing I know that can deal effectively with the carnal nature. Obedience. It's not obedience in of itself, but it keeps the blood flowing. See, it's the life of God. And as we obey, the life of God comes, gets out these habits. See, every disobedience creates a little stain, but the blood of Jesus removes it all. And as we walk with Him, as we walk with Him, the personality is actually recreated. So we become changed men. If we hold steady, He, that which we are new in potential and before Him because of the blood, becomes actuality, that sanctification. We really become different people. We really start loving everybody. We really open up to the joys of the kingdom. Isn't that great? See, it's so wonderful. It's superior because it purges us. That really is another point. Purges us of this terrible defilement. While getting ready to talk to you, I was pleading the blood because I remembered something that I said that I'm not sure whether it's criticism or not, but it borders on it. I didn't know what to do having to face you. I didn't know what to do except I remembered the blood. And so I said, Jesus, I plead the blood. And then I saw something else while I was getting ready to talk, and I was cleansed. But when, I, when I, I saw something else while I was talking to you, I said, Jesus, you've given me wisdom to know that certain things shouldn't be spoken because in and of themselves that may not be sin for me, but somebody else may take it and it becomes sin. That is, they take a knowledge of a fall or a failure or some difficulty, and they take it and it becomes criticism. So, Lord, give me not only wisdom to know what to speak and what not to speak, but give me the power not to speak what shouldn't be spoken when the wisdom comes. Well, that's wisdom more complete. Oh, Jesus, because when I look at an innocent person, when I see one who's really innocent and I see one who's really pure, oh, I have such a desire to, to be like that. Obedience makes me like that. There's power working in our life. Because we put aside ritual. Now here, I'm coming to the last point, but I've backed up a little bit. He says, to purge us from dead works. You see, these Jewish people, these Jewish Christians were thinking of going back to something that was dead. Something that was mere liturgy. And I want you to know, I want all scholars to know that when I look at R.C.H. Linsky, and when I look at F.F. F. Bruce, and when I look at uh, some of the other great scholars, they confirm this that although the allusion is to all sin, he specifically mentions dead works. Uh, A.B. Bruce is one of the great commentaries. And what he's saying is, is that ritual in and of itself may not be sinful, but when ritual is used as a means of appeasing the conscience, <laughs> 
and become sinful. And that's what most, that's what I was going to tell you I was getting to later in Christianity. See, we come to worship, but our heart's not clear. But the ritual of worship appeases, therefore it becomes sinful, and it's a dead wake. He said this blood will purge us from that. It will purge us and reach so deep. See, most all men, most all religions are making some effort to appease, but it's dead works. Much of Christianity is dead works. I heard Brother Helms say in a service where he was once in a great Christian church, he said, you know, I earnestly sat there and waited for the witness of the Spirit. I waited for one live moment. And finally, when the pastor said, Thy kingdom come, God operated in my heart. And he fed on that one thing out of one hour service. As far as he knew, that was all that was alive. Kingdom come. Oh, Jesus. Dead works. Dead works that become crippling. Dead works that become a hindrance. And these Jewish people were thinking back, going back to something that was primary liturgy in the first place. And that at its best, its only effectiveness that it was pointing to a greater time. And we're loaded down with it. We're loaded down with words that shouldn't be spoken. We're loaded down with songs that are out of order. We're loaded down with sermons that are not supposed to pre be preached. We're loaded down with services that have not one ounce of life in it. Though we give the Apostles' Creed and preach the gospel, the devil's pleas. Why? It hardens, appeases the conscience a little bit, but never pures us of the defilement. The purity of the defilement is to have a song that's in divine order. There's where the grace of God is dispensed. The purity is that we gather where Christ is ordained. The purity is, you see, you could just go on and on. You see how it is? Worship is a lot. So that we may serve, or so that we may serve the living God. And so Paul exhorts us, let us, see, what is that in Romans, uh, Romans 12? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not trying to find some work that would appease our conscience, but to do it in the only way that's acceptable to God, to accept the blood that cleanses us from all sin and walk in the spirit of that sacrifice, which keeps us open to the cleansing of that blood, keeps us fresh, and also gives us exactly what we need. Just like Brother Helm said to me, God wants you to preach in the book of Hebrews. There's life in it. Why? It's what he's ordained. The letter kills unless he's ordained it. Now think of it. See, this is a quite a specific and wonderful point, but I waited weeks to bring it out because I want to be sure that uh, West, uh, Westcott and Hart and and F.F. Uh, Bruce and R.C.H. Linsky, I want to be sure there was a consensus, and there is. See, he's trying to pull them away. Why, he said, do you want to go back when the Holy Spirit is leading your worship? Why do you want to go back to a ritual that's dead? In fact, it brings you into sin. The law itself is not sinful. But remember what Paul said about it? Actually becomes a stumbling block. And to go back, when now access is open, to go back when the life of Christ, the blood of Christ is flowing, to go back when we can be in the presence of God and know what he's saying and, and understand that he wants us to do something, why would we go back to something that's just a ritual? When you go back, you go back so that self-assertiveness may reign and the conscience be slightly pacified. But it's a, it's a good way to go to hell. In fact, it's as straight to hell as the outright sin. So Jesus said, the harlots and the publicans will get into heaven. The harlots and the publicans before, before the righteous. Why? Why, they're self-assertive. They're going through a ritual, and they're on their way to hell. But a man that's out in sin knows he's out in sin. Most of them, they're honest about it. And the very honesty is, is a step closer to glory than the man who's in church and is there with willful and coveted defilement. Well, can you hear the writers say now, how much more? They're in Rome. The letters just come in. Somebody's reading it. Don't you know it must have set up a vibration in some souls there that were on the edge and who not weren't attending church very regularly and kind of backed up and looked back at the old things. And they could hear the writers say it may have been under anointing like our 
like Brother Helm's interpreter was in, in Africa there. How much more? Oh. How much more? Well, they're in Rome. The letter's just come in. Somebody's reading it. Don't you know it must have set up a vibration in some souls there that were on the edge and who not weren't attending church very regularly and kind of backed up and looked back at the old things and they could hear the writer say it may have been under anointing like our like Brother Helm's interpreter was in, in Africa there. How much more? Oh, how much more? Well, that's what stirred John up. In the very beginning of the book of Revelation, after he gives him the message to all the churches, he begins to see that the saints and the angels are praising God. He looks into heaven, and he sees, first of all, they're praising God over the fact that he's creator. That's in the fourth chapter. As he looked at the throne in heaven, he sees the living creatures, and he sees the, those around the great white throne, and he hears them saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then he hears them say, he hears them say, you are worthy, our Lord and our God. You can use this in your time of prayer because the first reason we can praise him is because we are created by him and we're dependent upon him. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. Right there. See, the uncreated created us. And by your will, they were created and have their being. So being inferior and being in, uh, definite, of being uh, finite, we worship him who is infinite. That's in the fourth chapter. But wait a minute. What's the second reason for praising God? Well, just read on with me. Fifth chapter of Revelation. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. She said, John's weeping. See, see the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seal. Then I saw a lamb. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Boy, when you get to heaven, there's the blood right there. And now here's the second reason they're having such a great time around the throne. First of all, they were created. They're all finite, and he's infinite. But number two is the blood. The blood of Christ has been slain, the sacrificial blood of Christ. He said, I saw a lamb looking as it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven arms and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. Why? Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. Oh, I love it when I get in prayer. I love to get to that place where Jesus leads when I say, oh, you were slain. I praise you today because you were slain because your blood with your blood you purchased men for God. That's the NIV and I, I like that. You purchased men for God out of every tribe and language and people and nation. There's the Japanese and the Americans and the Germans. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. When I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, man, it en enlarges. And under the earth, great day, and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits upon the throne. And here's a reference to the blood and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I like 
I like the benediction here of these four living creatures. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. A blood superior. 